Income Tax 2022-2023 Payments Tax Software Example Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated with Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenario. Scenario! Those with, you can also get access to the form 1040 of related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Our starting point, single filer, Mr. Anderson, living in Beverly Hills, 90210, 100,000 W-2 income this time. We've got the 12,950. That's going to be the standard deduction getting us to the 87,050 for the taxable income. We're mirroring that in our Excel worksheet over here. 100,000 income, 12,950 standard deduction getting us to the 87,050. We're going to rely on the software to do the, ca the tax calculation. Page 2, 14,774. We withheld 15,000. We're going to start with to get to that 226 at the bottom line, which is mirrored over here on our income tax worksheet. So now we're going to be focused on the second half of the calculation. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. That being the payment type of calculation. So remember the first page of the form 1040 is in essence our income statement. And then the second page is going to be calculating the taxes, dealing with the credits, and dealing with the payments. So on the first page, we have the, the format of income. In this case, is going to be the W-2 income. So when we have the W-2 income, that reporting document will typically show the wages that were earned. That's going to be the amount that's going to be populated onto the first page and then the withholdings that will be made, which will be populated on the second page. So when we do the data input into our system, we'll see something like this. We've got the wages and then we've got the federal income tax withholdings as well as the Social Security and Medicare. We're focused on the federal income tax withholdings because we're looking at the federal income tax return, the uh, form 1040. So obviously the 100,000 populated on the first page, which will be used to calculate the taxable income, the bottom line in essence of our weird income statement, the tax being calculated on it on the second page at this, in this example, 14,774, then we're going to compare that to how much was with, which was withheld 15,000. Note that if this was a perfect world, this tax return, the form 1040 would just be an informational return. It would just be saying like payroll taxes, for example, like the form 941. Look, this is how much I actually owe in taxes. I already paid you in this case through withholdings and therefore there wouldn't be any refund or any amount due at that time. However, the tax code is way too complicated to be able to do that. That's why the withholdings are usually structured and we purposely structure them on our end to try to overshoot the amount of taxes that are going to be paid so that we can result in a refund, hopefully actually a small refund. We don't really, if we have a big refund, that means we way overestimated and we could have gotten our money sooner by reducing the amount of withholdings. The only reason we want the refund at all is because we want to make sure that we're not getting hit with the penalties and interest. That's the general idea. If I can get the money sooner, that's typically better to have the money sooner, to have more money per paycheck, as opposed to a big lump sum refund uh, for the tax time refund. Now also note that the second half of the tax form you would think would be fairly straightforward. We calculate the tax and then we just see how much we actually paid. But as we have seen, there are going to be areas where this gets more complex because we've got the tax that we have to calculate. 
and then we have to deal with the credits. We'll dive into credits later, but we've got these credits that could be refundable credits, and we have the credits that would be non-refundable, which means that we have to kind of break them out separately on this page too. That muddies up the whole situation. And we also note that there could be other taxes that we have to include as well. For example, if we had the self-employment tax, so if we had a Schedule C type of business, as we saw in prior presentations, we might have self-employment tax that we would also have to add to the federal income tax because it's not being taken care of with the W-2. And then on the withholding side of things, or on the payment side of things, we could have payments from the W-2, which is most common, particularly when people are in their working years, but we could have withholdings from 1099s as well. And that might be more common for people in retirement years, most common 1099 form being the 1099R. And then we could have estimated tax payments that we made into the system, which is quite common for businesses that have a Schedule C type of situation. If I mirror this in our worksheet over here, the payment that we made down here, I've made another worksheet for that so that we had the payments and there is our payment for the withholdings and there and that's going to be pulling into our worksheet on page one. All right, so let's think about a situation where someone is like retired and they're getting they're getting 1099 and you have a you have a withholding from a 1099 kind of situation. So in that case, you might have like a 1099 R that's coming from a pension plan or something like that. It would be a normal distribution if they were in retirement. So I'm going to say normal distribution here, although I'm not changing the age or anything. Just for an example, I'm going to say 50,000 distribution. It would generally be taxable because although it's coming out of, of their savings account, it's in a retirement plan and they got the deferral of the retirement plan. Therefore, they have to pay taxes on it and they have to think about how they're gonna be making payments on that money because it's gonna be income. They could do that possibly through withholdings or they can make estimated tax payments. And note, when people are in retirement, this is often kind of a shocking kind of situation for a lot of people because all of their income has been withheld for the, for with regards to income taxes if they were a W-2 employee their entire lifetime. And then in retirement, they're gonna to have to be a little bit more active possibly to think about what their withholdings should be from like a retirement account, like a, a pension plan or something like that, or make estimated tax payments, which takes a little bit more planning than they may have had to do when they were taking their W-2 uh, withholdings. But in any case, that is gonna be, we're on page two again in the payments and it's similar it's now it's on 25b so we've made another uh payment situation i didn't remove the last one so we have now the added 10,000. so here's the total tax here's the payments uh, that are added together both withholdings one in a w-2 the second on the form 1099 and then the difference between the two is going to be the 1728. uh so another situation that could come up it's not as common as you might have income from let's say that we have income from gambling so someone got a w2 g so because they had gambling winnings let's say it was a significant winnings of like twenty thousand or something in that case the the they may be required by the casino or whoever they won from to withhold part of the money let's just say two thousand five hundred and so that would then be another withholding type of form. So any kind of income form now being reported here, you want to you want to make sure to check that withholding box to see if there are withholdings on it. But it's most likely you're going to see the withholdings on the W-2s, then the 1099-R, and then you would think possibly uh, like like gambling winnings if they were substantial that they might have a withholding situation there. Okay, so now let's think about a situation where we have a Schedule C. So if I have a Schedule C, then I don't have a withholding situation because no one else is going to be doing my withholding. I'm not going to be able to have my employer do the withholdings. We're going to have, in this case, we got the, our standard 100,000 and we saw all the other things that happened with the Schedule C, self-employment tax being calculated. That's going to be populated up here on the form 1040, page number two. So now we've got the self-employment tax because uh, we have to deal not only with the federal income tax but the social security and medicare because that hasn't been taken care of with the payroll taxes 
And so that's going to be included. So that's in included with the federal income tax, given our tax calculation. And then our payment situation would have to be made with basically estimated tax payments. Now note, this is something oftentimes that new businesses uh, overlook because if you go from a W-2 situation to a situation where you have a Schedule C business, many people just aren't, they don't have the mindset. It's a mindset. To think, oh, I have to make estimated ta tax payments as I earn the money because when they were a W-2 employee, it happened automatically. They didn't have a choice. They weren't actively participating in the process. They weren't writing the check. So because of that, I think a lot of people get behind on their business. So you got to make sure that we make the payments during the year. Otherwise, you're going to end up, of course, with a substantial tax bill. And even if the business was successful, it's going to be a problem. Also, people tend to forget about the Social Security and Medicare, the self-employment tax, which is substantial. And even if they do factor it in, they may undershoot how high it's going to be because they're thinking of it as being similar to Social Security and Medicare on their withholdings uh, when they were a W-2 employee. And as we talked about, it's actually double that or close to double because they assume you are the employer and employee. So you really want to make sure you're doing those projections and if you're helping anybody with their business to make sure that they're on their, they're factoring in the tax payments. So the tax payments would be done with, uh, with withholdings. So they'd have to make withholdings usually on a quarterly basis then. So if I think about the quarterly payments, let's go down here and just say that we made, I'll just say 10,000 each time, 10,000. Notice the due date for the first quarter, which is three months of the year. So January, February, March of 2022 is due by April the following month. So let's say we made it 041522. And the second quarter payment, we'll say 10,000 again, we'll make it even. And it's gonna be on uh, 06-15-22. And then I'm gonna tab through here, then 10,000 for the third quarter, which might've been on, we're gonna say 09-15-22. And then finally 10,000 for the fourth quarter. This is where it gets a little bit messy because the fourth quarter payment for 2022, the fourth quarter ends, in December isn't due until January 15th of 2023. So you've got this crossover and they've got to make sure that when they're making their payments, it's being allocated to the proper year. Let's make sure this, let's say this was made on 01-15-23. You also have to be careful on the state payments because you because if the state payments are deductible, if you have state income tax, if they're deductible on the federal side of things, the question is, you, you, is it deductible when I made the payment? Usually it's deductible when you made the payment, right? Even though it's not, not, it's on a cash basis, meaning not the fact that you, this last payment would be deductible possibly if it was a state tax payment on, for example, the form 10, uh, the form schedule A, uh, but it wouldn't be until 2023, Right, even though it was made for the federal income, for the state income taxes for 2022, right? You have that cutoff problem is gonna be an issue. So if I go back on over here, then we're gonna say now I have the payments that were made, estimated tax payments are the 40,000 that are pulling over, even though that last payment here was made for uh, in 2023, we told the IRS to apply it to uh, 2022, and so they properly did that. Note that uh, usually the assumption for your income for the Schedule C is that you earn the income like evenly over the years. Therefore, they want you to have an even number of payments, although that might not always be the case. And so you could look into exceptions if you're saying, hey, look, I earned all of the income, or maybe I didn't even start my business until like December or something. Uh, like that, then then you have an uneven earnings. And so you would think it wouldn't be fair to make your payments evenly throughout the year. But the general assumption by the IRS is that you made your earnings evenly throughout the year and they want to be paid then, you know, basically even payments throughout the year. And oftentimes the way that's going to be structured is that you will base it on the prior year tax return and think about how much you think you're going to make in the future year based on that and then set up your estimated payment structure based on that is the general idea. Now also note, you may have had in a prior year, a refund 
of your 2021 taxes. If you had a refund of the 2021 taxes, you could have the IRS give you the refund and then maybe make a payment for the estimated taxes for 2022. Or you could just say, hey, take that refund and apply it to 2022. So you got to make sure you're picking that up. Notice that this amount is usually will be picked up by the tax software if you're using the same, same tax software from the prior year to the current year because it'll roll over and say, hey, look, you got a refund and you told the software that I want you to take that refund and apply it to the, to the payments in the following year. And so you'll be able to do that. But if there was a change, say by the IRS that said, hey, look, your refund was adjusted and you accept the change, they adjust it and say, and say maybe they adjust it to like 2000 instead of 3000. If you don't adjust that in your software or, or you don't get the letter because the client doesn't give it to you, then that rollover can get messed up. So you want to make sure that you want to check that. And these days, more and more, they're, they are, they are, uh, people are, are using the, the accounts, uh, the IRS accounts. You can look up your payments and you can look up notices and whatnot. So it's a good practice these days to have a client or yourself for your own tax return. You call this a tax return? To go onto the IRS website and look up and see if you got any notices or any changes in the tax or something like that, that would mess up any of those rollovers to make and look at your estimated payments. So to make sure you have it right on your side compared to what's on, on their side, which again, that means that you've got the right cutoff date. You applied the payments to the right period and they've got the right cutoff dates. They got the payments applied to the right period. The rollover from the prior year is rolling over properly and they didn't change the prior year tax refund that got rolled over. Now note down below, you've got your overpayment here, and this is the amount that's gonna be uh, refunded to you. And notice line 16, the amount of line uh, 34, you want applied to your 2023 taxes. So this is where you would, you would tell them if I was in 2023, apply overpayment to 2023. Let's just say it like 2000. And so, so now I, so now I want you to apply the 2000 over to the following year, right? So I can get the refund or I can say, keep it and apply it to the next year. Now also note when you're making these estimated payments as a, as a uh, sole proprietorship, uh, that it, if you get backed up on the estimated payments, you can see how, how much of a mess this will be, right? If you didn't make any estimated tax payments, you're going to be owing the taxes for the whole year plus federal income tax plus the the estimated tax payments and you're going to have to be paying the quarterly tax payments for the next year so by april 15th you're going to have this big tax bill not only do you have the big tax bill for 2022 but you've got the first quarter of 2023 that you need to make the estimated tax payments for now usually the way you figure the estimated tax payments is you let the you you work with the software typically to take your prior year income and try to figure out if you project that forward what your estimated tax payments will be and you you could generate the vouchers or have a schedule and pay them pay them in whatever pay them online or mail a check if you want to use a voucher uh, kind of system but you can use that at least as the baseline and you can think of possibly having some safe harbor rules based on your prior year income to avoid penalties and interest in other words you you really don't know what your income is going to be next year if your income is quite volatile on a new business in particular your income could be much more or less so what you what you want to do then is is try to come up with an estimate based on the prior year as your baseline. And also if there's any kind of safe harbor that you could say, Hey, look, I made my estimated payments based on last year's uh, income. If I made more, I didn't really know that. So maybe, and so then that's an, so I can avoid basically penalties and interest. So in other words, if you can, if you get to a situation where your income was higher, but you were still able to avoid the excess penalty and interest, that's still good because then that's what our major goal is to not have to pay more taxes than we otherwise 
I would have to would have to pay is the is the is the general idea. So you can look at your prior year tax returns. You can use that as the baseline to figure your estimated tax payments. See if you can get a safe harbor uh, kind of situation, so they're not going to hit you with added penalties and interest. And then if you go, uh, and then you could if you're going to go over that amount of income, then you can make excess more payments or increase your estimated payments so that you don't end up with a, a big tax bill. And also, again, to make sure that you're avoiding, you know, penalties and interest. So that's the general idea with that one. Now, just a quick note, uh, if they were, if you have a married, if you have a married couple type of situation, you can, you can see how, how things get a little bit messy because now when you file the joint return, let's pick one up here. So now we have a, a married filing joint return and we have the, the, the one person, uh, one spouse is earning income through the schedule C and the other one is doing more work uh, with the W-2. Now note that they have a, if you have a big substantial difference in the income levels, then it gets kind of messy to figure out what the estimated tax payments should be from one spouse to the other, because note that obviously the spouse that's making the lesser income, in this case, the W-2 income is gonna be pushed into a higher tax bracket on the joint return than they otherwise would have due to the due to the 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 high the higher income when you combine basically the incomes together possibly so then the question is what's the fair breakout of the withholdings from one to the other because if they were filing single they would have a lower amount but and at the same time of course the when we're talking about income taxes we're only talking about work that is being taxable with regards to the internal revenue service and we're not talking about housework and that kind of stuff. So you got to take that into consideration when you're trying to figure out what would be appropriate for the withholding structure, as well as what would be a appropriate for the the refund. So clearly when you're fi married filing joint, you're going to have a, if you have a, a refund situation or a amount that is owed situation, and you're trying to figure out who, you know, which partner should be paying more out of whichever pay, you know, pay check versus the business in this case, it can get a little bit confusing because of the different uh, income tax brackets when you have people that, that earn different amounts and because of, again, work that's not being included in the calculation of taxes when you get to taxable income, that's gonna be because of you know other work like taking care of the home and that kind of stuff. But usually it comes up to a better, you're in a better spot by filing married filing jointly and then figuring out how best to to divvy up any refunds or how to deal with the withholdings rather than filing married filing separate because a lot of times when you file married filing separate you're going to be you could lose some capacities to take some credits and deductions which we've talked about a little bit before we might talk about a little bit more when we get into the credits